Well, hey, I don't know about you, but I am so excited for today. Every single week, I show up to church full of expectation, full of anticipation for God to show up and do something in my life and in the life of our church. And today is no different. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Mark and myself and my wife, Roberta, uh, co-pastor Rose Church together. And it's so much fun. And I say this every time, uh, we are grateful to be a part of this community. We're grateful to you and for you, and we are grateful to God for all that he's doing in us and through us. It's just so much fun and we love it tremendously. Uh, I'm excited for today, and I believe that God is gonna deposit something and speak life into each and every single one of us who are tuning in. So no matter where you are, what you're up to, what you're doing, get ready for God to do something. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, our text for today is Mark chapter nine. We're gonna be looking at verses 14 all the way through 29. Uh, I'm going to read it in just a moment, and then we'll spend some time talking about it and trying to learn from it uh, together. But before I do, I want to let you know, God is up to something in the life of our church. See, we were actually in a collection on the book of Philippians. God told us to pause that so he can begin to give us vision and dreams and direction. The Holy Spirit is, is leading us so strongly in this season, and I'm so excited about it. And I'm going to talk more about that next week at Heart and soul. And so I just want to make sure that you get a personal invite from me to be at heart and soul. We're taking over Sunday morning and I'm just going to be speaking life and dreams and vision into our church. And then Sunday night at 7:30 on Zoom, we're going to all go on Zoom together as a church and we're going to begin to look even deeper into what I talk about Sunday morning and just continue to hear from God and and allow him to speak to us and lead us and guide us as a church. And so I would love for you to be a part of that. If you consider yourself the heart and soul of this community, definitely show up and, and be there for Sunday morning and Sunday evening. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so today we're going to be in Mark chapter 9, verses 14, all the way down through 29. So if you have your Bibles, you can pull that out right now to follow along. If you don't, it's all good. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, but I would just encourage you to take notes. So pull out a notepad, pull out your phone, turn off Put turn uh, uh, do not disturb on so nobody bothers you so you don't get any notifications or texts or anything like that. And uh, yeah, let's jump into it. And uh, we'll, we'll pray in a moment and then we'll talk about this text. So John ch or Mark chapter four, ugh, Mark chapter nine, verses 14, and uh, we'll read to 29. So, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the, the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So much in this text, so much to unpack. We'll do that in just a moment. But before we do, would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for 
this time together. I thank you that even in the midst of a pandemic, we're still able to to gather in some way. We're still able to be together. We're still able to, you know, talk to each other in the chat and sit under your word and worship and praise you. And so I just thank you that that you have made a way for us to still grow and still meet with you and, and meet with each other uh, in, in different and unique ways. And I just pray right now that you would come into this space. Each of us are at a different in a different season. We're all experiencing different circumstances and life looks different for us all. But God, I know that your word can speak to us all. And so I pray that right now. We ask that you would would just speak to us. Meet us where we're at. God, lift our spirits. Give us dreams. Give us vision. God, give us faith. Um, Stir up something new and fresh inside of us. And God, transform us. We know that routine and religion and and, and the, the mundane and monotonous and church services, all these things that we do, they, they, they can't change us, but we do them so we can create a, a moment with you and encounter with you, and that changes everything. And so, God, we pray that we would encounter you today and that you would transform our lives and have your way in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, today I want to talk about faith, and the title of my message is Give Me Faith. Now, I don't want to brag or, or anything like that, but, but I want to let you know and give you some insight into my life. I am a man of great faith. I have tremendous faith. And again, I'm not bragging. I'm not boasting. I'm just giving you some insight into my life. And here's why I feel like I have such great faith is because multiple times a week, I have to get into a moving car while my wife, Roberta, drives said moving car. Now, most of the time I do the driving, but we're sharing a car right now. And so I'll drive to work some days and, and she'll be with me with, with our baby Rome and she'll drive and need the car all day. And then she'll come to pick me up. And when she picks me up, she refuses to get out of the car. She does it just to terrify me, I guess, because driving with Roberta is one of the scariest things you can ever do in life. Now I've, I've experienced some scary things. But many of those scary things and scariest times in my life happen to be with Roberta behind the wheel. It's absolutely terrifying. It's like a roller coaster every time you drive with her, but not like a fun roller coaster that you trust, like at Disneyland or or anything like that. It's like a pop-up carnival that you know they built that ride in a day and a half and you just do not trust it. That's what it is like driving with my wife. Now she's got so many amazing talents, so many abilities and giftings, but this is not one of her talents or giftings. And I'm not making fun of her. I'm not being mean or cruel or anything like that. I asked her if I could share this with our church and she said yes, because she acknowledges that she's not the greatest driver. And so every time I get into a car with my wife, like I don't know what's gonna happen. So I I step into that car and I, I am a man of faith. I am a man of God. I'm praying, I'm praying in tongues. I'm pleading the blood of Christ over everyone who's in our vehicle because it is just that terrifying. And it's not like she drives recklessly. I actually don't know what it is. It's just scary. She hits curbs, she swerves, she 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 goes, you know, all over the place and doesn't follow directions. And it's 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 honestly one of the scariest things you can do. And so I'm I'm just like Sherlock Holmes in that moment. Like my senses are up. I got like spidey senses. I'm I'm focused on who's around us, what vehicle is, vehicles are around us. Where's Roberta looking? Is she looking at the road? Is she looking at something else? How fast is she going? What's happening? I'm just aware of everything because I'm absolutely terrified. And I'm just like, I, I just have to have faith that we're going to get to where we're going, that she's going to, you know, get us to our destination safely. But I, I just never know. I, I never know. Is she going to see the pothole? that's 10 feet in front of us that everyone else sees? If she does see it, is she going to dodge it? I don't know. Or is she just going to run right over it and wreck our suspension? Like, I just have no clue what's going to happen when I get into the car. So it requires faith from me to be in a, in a moving vehicle with my wife, Roberta. And life is full of, of, of faith moments. Life requires faith from us, doesn't it? I'll give you a classic example. Every time we sit in a chair, we have faith, we trust, and we believe that that chair is going to hold us up, that we will not fall, but we will be suspended and supported by that chair. Every time we eat, we have faith that that food is going to nourish us and not poison us. When we drive, we have faith that our car will accelerate when we hit the gas and it will slow down when we hit the brake. And so life is full of faith. And and so today I want to talk about faith, specifically and particularly when it comes to our faith in God, 
our belief in Jesus, our trust in the Holy Spirit. And as we look at this text, Mark chapter 9, it's all about faith. There's so much that we could pull from this text about faith because the Christian faith, our faith in Jesus, is not like faith in a chair or faith in a car or faith in food, not poisoning us, but, but nourishing us. It's different. And so as we look at this text, I want to make four observations about our faith. And I'm believing and trusting that as we make these observations from this story, God is going to stir up our faith and do something in our lives. So observation number one is this about faith from Mark chapter nine is faith is on the move. Faith is on the move. You can write that down. Faith is on the move. In the scriptures, faith is not a noun. It is a verb. To, it's, it's not just a belief, it's believing. It's not just trust, it is trusting. It's, it's a verb, it's not a noun. It's, it's in action, it's acting, it's going, it's moving. We have a faith that does not sit still. We have a faith that is perpetually moving forward. God is always calling us in faith to the next thing, to keep going. We are compelled by faith to move forward. It never stays still, it is never stagnant, it is never static, it is always on the go. It is on the move. And, and, and we see this in the story. So the story starts off, Jesus is with some disciples. He's, he's, he's on a mountain. And we actually talked about this last week. So, so uh, there's this crazy moment that happens on the mountain. After that's done, they're walking down. The rest of his disciples are at the bottom of the mountain. Jesus, they're walking down and they see this big crowd. And there's a commotion. There's something happening. As they get closer, Jesus kind of walks. He walks through the crowd. And there's still, you know, some arguing, some bickering. Jesus gets there and he says to his disciples, like, what are you arguing about? And immediately, pff, silence. Nothing. No one says a word. The, the Pharisees, the, the Jewish religious leaders who, who are arguing with the disciples, nothing. Silent. The disciples have been caught in the act. They're like, they're, they're feeling silly because they... Uh, we're doing something that Jesus wouldn't have endorsed. They're fighting, they're arguing, they're bickering. And it's just silence. No one says a word. And then this father, he interjects himself. He, he inserts himself into the story. He butts in. Jesus was not speaking to him. But this father, he, he's like, hey, hey, Jesus, they're arguing about my, my, my son. See, he's sick. He's, he's got a demon. He's possessed. And it causes him to do terrible things. He's, he's suffering. He's, he's, he's constantly being hurt and harmed. And, and I, I brought him to your disciples because I heard about you and how you could heal and do miracles. And I brought him to your disciples thinking that they could do the same. And, and unfortunately, they were not able to, to, um, to heal my son. And he's still sick. He's still suffering. And so we see in this moment, faith on the move. Because this man could have stayed home. This man's son, this father's son, was sick for a long time. And no doubt he tried many things to heal him and find a cure for what was going on in his life. But he never quit. Why? Because his faith was on the move. His faith forced him to keep moving forward, to keep pursuing and seeking after Jesus. Every attempt was a step closer to Jesus. And that's ultimately what our faith moves us towards. Our faith moves us towards Jesus. But this father could have thrown in the towel. This father could have walked away after, this, after the disciples uh, failed to heal his son. Uh, he, even in this moment, Jesus was not speaking to him. He, he was speaking to his disciples. And he, he didn't care about the social norms or manners or the customs. He, see, faith defies conventional wisdom. Faith takes risks. Faith looks weird to some people. Faith even looks rude and cocky to some people. But this father, he interjects, he steps into the story, he butts in, was not being spoken to, but he did everything in his power to get a face-to-face -face with Jesus, to plead his case and, and bring to him what he needed for him and for his son. Why? Because that's what faith does. It moves us to act. It doesn't sit on a couch. It doesn't wait around. It doesn't give up. It doesn't throw in the towel. Faith is on the move. So that's our first observation from this text in Mark chapter 9. The second observation is this. Faith has a place. Again, write this down. Faith has a place. And so if faith has a place, well, then faith can be misplaced. And as human beings, as, as followers of Jesus, we misplace our faith often. Oftentimes, we put our faith in a movement. We put our faith in a, in a political party. We put our faith in the market, in the stock exchange, in the economy. We put our faith in people, our parents, our spouses, our friends who we're dating. 
We put our faith in a variety of different things, but we misplace our faith. And every time we put our faith in the wrong thing, in the wrong person, in the wrong situation, when we put it in the wrong place, when we misplace it, we oftentimes end up being disappointed. And this is exactly what happened to the father in the story. See, the father in the story put his faith in the disciples to heal his son. He misplaced his faith and in doing so was left disappointed. And we see in the story that it wasn't just disappointment, it actually created damage. It began to distort his view of Jesus and it, it created a, a divide in his relationship and his faith in Jesus. See, oftentimes when we misplace our faith, we begin to associate the thing and correlate and create connection between the thing we put our faith in and God, even though our faith isn't in God, it is, it's in something else. But when that thing or that person, our parents, our friends, our spouse, our, our employers, whatever, disappoint us, because we put our faith in them and we correlate it to God, we begin to look at God differently. And so, so looking at this story, we see this happening. See, he put his faith in the disciples, the dis disciples failed him, and then he goes to Jesus and he says, if you can do anything. And we see him expressing doubt. He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. He begins questioning God. Can you do this? I think you can, but I'm not really sure. And all of this was created and caused and stirred up because of the failure of the disciples. And so when we misplace our faith, it's actually dangerous and it begins to damage our uh, view of Jesus. And so faith has a place. We've got to put our faith in the right place. Faith has a place. Can I say it this way? Faith has a face because we don't put our faith in, in a thing or, or, or something. We put our faith in a person. We put our faith in Jesus. We put our faith in him and it's not in the things that he can do for us. It's not in the things that he can give us. It's, faith is not believing that God will give me what I want. Faith is letting God be God. That's what faith is. It's just saying, God, you be God. So it's our faith is not in an outcome. Our faith is not in things working out the way we want them to work out. Yes, we're going to pray for certain things. We're going to pray for miracles and healing and restoration and promotion and financial security and, and health. We're going to pray for all of those things. When we're in trouble, we're going, to, we're going to pray and ask God to come in. But our faith is not in the thing that we're praying for happening or coming to pass. Our faith is in Jesus. Faith is letting God be God. When we put our faith in the right place, when we put our faith in the person of Jesus, we, we trust him completely. And so I'm praying for, let's say, a promotion. But if I don't get the promotion, my faith is not shaken because my faith wasn't in the promotion. My faith was in Jesus. So if I don't get the promotion, then because my faith is in Jesus, I say, God, I don't know why I didn't get the job I don't, or, or the promotion. I don't know why it didn't happen, even though I prayed for it. But because my faith is in you and I trust that you are good and sure and true and you have my best interests at heart, I will continue to trust you. You must have something better for me. You must have something even greater than I can even imagine or think or comprehend. And so we put our faith in the right place in the person of Jesus, not in, you know, movements or politicians or ideas or anything like that. It's going to it's going to it's going to hurt our faith. It's going to damage our relationship with Jesus. We got to fight to put our faith in the right place in the person of Jesus, regardless of outcome. Let him be God. Let him have control and authority of our lives, we need to surrender to him and say, God, I, I don't know why it happened that way. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why, you know, I prayed so hard for this and it didn't come to pass, but I trust you. And that's what faith is at its core. Faith has a place. So number one, observation, faith is on the move. Number two, faith has a place. And number three, write this down, faith sets the stage. Faith actually sets the stage for God to move in your life. Your faith is either giving him access or denying him to move in your life and do incredible supernatural, to create testimonies, to work wonders. You're either permitting him by your faith or you're prohibiting him by your faith. And I'm not saying that whatever you have faith for is going to happen. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying whatever you pray for, whatever you want, whatever you ask God for is, is going to happen. But what I am saying, is if we don't have faith for it, if we don't believe for it, if we don't trust for it, it will not happen. Why? Because faith sets the stage. Faith opens the door for God to come into our lives and do a supernatural, incredible, miraculous work. Faith opens the door for the healing. Faith opens the door for the miracle. Faith opens the door for, for, for that whatever the situation is in our lives to be worked out. 
You know, God will only move to the level of your faith. Your life will only ever be as big as your faith is. And so church, let's allow our faith to be audacious. Let's have crazy, radical, scandalous, unbelievable faith so we can set the stage for all that God wants to do. He will not force a miracle in your life. He will not force testimony into your life. He will not work in your life if you do not want him to, if you do not allow him to. And the way you give him permission is to have faith. Faith says, God, come into my life. God, I believe. And we see this in the Father. If the father did not make his way to Jesus, if his faith was not in the move, on the move, and if his faith, faith did, not have, uh, did not go to the right place in Jesus, then it would not have set the stage for the miracle. See, see, Jesus healed his son. His son was healed. His son was delivered. His son was fine. They got the healing. They got the miracle. But if this father stayed home, if this father allowed the failure of the disciples to discourage him and shake his faith, um, which, which it did to a degree, but if he allowed it to completely dis, uh, you know, throw away his faith and disregard his faith in Jesus and stop trusting in Jesus and believing for Jesus, it wouldn't have set the stage. He ne his son never would have been healed, but he fought for faith. He, yes, he had doubt, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but he still had faith in Jesus, that Jesus could do anything. And it set the stage for a miracle. God will only ever move in your life as much as you allow him to. He is a gentleman. He's not gonna force his way into your life. He's not gonna force miracles into your life. And so our role, our job as followers of Jesus is to believe him for abundance, to believe him for more, to believe him for wonder, to believe him for dreams and visions for our lives. And it's not that our faith is dependent on those things, right? It's in Jesus that he's up to something, that he's working for our good. He loves us and wants the best for us. So it's in him. But as we feel prompted by him and led by him to pray and believe and have faith for specific things in our lives, it sets the stage for him to come in and work in power. And as he moves in our lives based on our faith, see, here's the thing. God doesn't need your faith, but we need our faith. We need our faith so we can position ourselves in the right place for God to move. The father's faith forced him to position himself in the right way. He fought for a face to face. He was in the right position, the right place, the right time for this miracle. See, when, when, when we act in faith, it allows us to set the stage to get in the right place, to get in the right position, to receive from God what he wants to give us. And I've seen this over and over in, in, in my life. Faith setting the stage. Faith set the stage for this church to be born. God gave myself and Roberta a vision eight years ago of a church in a Canadian city that would move and impact and, and shake the city that it was in, that it would have incredible uh, uh, fruit and, 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 and amazing ministry. And we're seeing that happen eight months in, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic. This church is, is a result of faith and not just myself and Roberta, but people, pastors, leaders, regular, ordinary people from all across Canada who prayed for this community, who invested in this community. The launch team, we had 52 people who started this church back in September. It was faith that set the stage for what we're seeing and experiencing now. And church, in this next season of our life as a community, what God is calling us into is going to require great faith. He has so many things that he wants to use us to accomplish. God wants to use Rose Church to shake this city, to turn Winnipeg upside down for the glory of God, to advance the kingdom. Like I have no doubt in my mind that Winnipeg will be a pillar of hope, a beacon of light and, 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 and hope for this city. But it's going to require faith. See, God has all these plans, but it's going to require us in faith to believe and trust him to set the stage for him to move in us and through us so that people can be reached, so that people can come to know Jesus, so that people's lives can be transformed by the Holy Spirit, so they can encounter grace and mercy and peace and hope and faith and love all from Jesus as we step out and respond in faith. And what about your own life? What do you believe in God for in your own life? What do you need to set the stage for him to do? See, if, if you don't have the faith for it, it's, it's just probably not gonna happen. So, so let's have faith. And let's pray and let's believe and let's trust that God can do incredible things in our lives. 
And let's talk about doubt for a moment, because we see in the story, this father's doubting. The failure of the disciples caused him to doubt. And so he goes to Jesus, he says, if you can, he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. So there's doubt. And so if faith opens doors and faith sets the stage, the question becomes, does doubt close the door? And I would submit to you today that I don't think it does. See, 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 he, I, the, the father's miracle still happened. His son was still healed even though he had faith and doubt together. And see, that's the thing. Faith and doubt often go together. Where you have one, you're, you're going to have the other. And I would say whenever you have faith, there's going to be at least an inkling of doubt. Because our faith is in Jesus and not an outcome, and we don't know what God is going to do. So we trust Jesus, but we don't know what there's, the result's going to be. Of course there's going to be doubt. Of course there's going to be uncertainty. That's okay. The Bible tells us with, a, with faith the size of a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith, we can move mountains. So it's not about doubt not being existing. And here's the thing about doubt, is doubt is not faith failing, it's faith fighting. Doubt is not your faith failing, it is your faith fighting. It's not a sign that you've given up. It's not a sign that you don't believe. It's a sign that you're fighting to believe, that you're fighting to trust, that you're fighting to lean into what God says and what God promised and what God wants to do in your life. And so often, whenever we feel doubt or, or sense doubt in our lives, we feel ashamed. And we want to hide and we go and we research and we cut ourselves off from the community and we just research and that's not bad to research but but i love what the father does in this story with his doubt you know what he does he he takes the mask off and he's honest and authentic with jesus he says jesus i'm doubting jesus i believe but help my help my own belief he's just honest and raw and real with jesus you don't have to hide your doubt you don't have to be ashamed of your doubt you don't have to be uh, worried or, or uh, uh, you know, God's not upset with you when you're uncertain. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. That's all you need, even less than that. And so it's okay when you have doubt in your life. And of course, we want to fight to trust God more and more and more. But every great step of faith that I've ever taken, there's been a degree of doubt. There's been a degree of uncertainty because I'm stepping into the unknown. I'm about to walk around a corner and I have no idea what's out there, except I know that Jesus is out there. So that gives me the ability to take that step of faith. So, so, so faith sets the stage for God to do miracles in our lives and do incredible things in our lives. And as we close today, the final observation I want to make is this is faith is an invitation. Faith is an invitation. In this story, when the disciple, when Jesus finds out the disciples were not able to heal this father's son, he says to them, oh, you faithless generation. He speaks to their lack of faith. He says, oh, you faithless generation. And then at the end of the story, we read when all this has happened and everything is done, everyone's gone home, they go to the house to, to, to get ready for dinner or, or something or spend the night. And the disciples go to him privately and they say, why were we not able to, to heal this boy? And Jesus said, this, this kind of thing can only be done through prayer. And so we see that, that prayer or that, um, that the source of faith is prayer. That prayer actually fuels faith. So they couldn't heal because they didn't have faith. And why didn't they have faith? Well, because it needed prayer. And so prayer fuels faith. And so what is faith? Is it, It's an invitation to pray. It's an invitation to talk to God. It's an invitation to connect with him. It's an invitation to get in our word, to, to, to read this incredible love letter that God has given to us. Thousands uh, 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 of pages of, of God's words written specifically for us so he could speak to us. This is what faith is. It's an invitation to, to read his words, to, to hear from him. And, and I'm not saying audibly. I just mean like as God speaks to our souls and our spirits, this divine connection that we have where we sense the Holy Spirit, where we sense God leading us, guiding us, and prompting us. See, when we get in that private place, God begins to do uh, miracles through our lives in the public place. But it's that private place, that place of prayer that's so important. It gives us the power and everything we need to have faith and believe God and trust God in the public places. And so it's an invitation. It's an invitation to connect with God. It's an invitation to be in relationship with God. It's an invitation to just get to know God and for God to get to know us, to be loved by God so he can fuel our faith, so we can go out and make a difference in the world. But it's all about coming to him. He is the source of life. He is the source of faith. He is the source of miracles. It's all about him. This whole story 
shows us and points to Jesus. If you want miracles in your life, if you want faith to stir up in your life, if you want to believe God for more, if you want to trust God more, what do you need to do? Accept the invitation to get into his presence, to get into a space and place where you can just connect with God, where you can worship him and praise him and and plead and petition and cry and yell and smile and laugh and, and celebrate or whatever it is that you need to do. But the whole point of it is, is relationship with Jesus. And that is the invitation of faith. And as a church, as Jesus extends this invitation to all of us, can I Can I plead with you to accept this invitation, to make this a priority in your life? I mentioned before, but where God is leading us as a church is going to require great faith, more faith than we've ever had before. We need to believe him for more than we ever have before. And if we want that faith, well, we need to start with prayer. And so accept this invitation. And I'm excited to share more about where I believe God is leading us as a church and Roberta and I have been praying and talking and, and, and God just has some incredible things, some crazy things, some unbelievable things that as I share next week at heart and soul in the morning and in the evening, you're just going to shake your head unless you have faith to believe. And that faith comes through accepting the invitation that God extends to each and every single one of us to pray, to talk to him and to listen to him and to be in relationship with him. And if you're here today and you have never made a decision to be in relationship with Jesus, if you've never made a decision to follow him and surrender your life to him, I wanna extend that invitation to you today. You can give your life to Jesus today. You know, he loves you, he cares for you, he values you, he sees you, he's with you. He died on the cross for you, he resurrected from from, from, from the dead for you. He ascended to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit for you so his presence could live in you. He did all of it for you. And if you're here and you want to accept that invitation to know God, to be in relationship with God and follow God, well, you can do so today simply by praying. And how you pray that prayer, how you talk to God, that's up to you. It's just something like, God, I surrender my life. God, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for leading me to this church so I could hear uh, from your word and, and, and experience you. And I just want to follow you. And as you pray that prayer in your own way, well, that's the beginning of your relationship with God. And he'll, he'll take it from there. He'll surround you with people. He'll teach you what it means to follow him. And, and if you, well, if you do make that decision today, I just want to say congratulations. Come on in the chat right now. Can we put our hands together? Praise hand emojis, heart emojis, all that stuff for the people who just made a decision to follow Jesus. We're so excited for you. Welcome home. But on our website, if you go to rosechurch.ca slash Jesus, there's a bunch of information and resources there. There's also a connect card that you can fill out. And can I encourage you to fill out to let us know that you made this decision today? And we're just so, so, so excited for you. What an incredible decision you've just made. And and once again, we're celebrating, but go to our website and and, and fill out a connect card so we can connect with you and and just journey because we can't do this journey uh, with Jesus alone. And um, so so right now, we're gonna gonna send it off to our worship team to spend some time and worship. And as you pray and as you worship, I am uh, just, I'm praying that God would stir all of our faith and that he would give us faith big enough that we could go and heal people, that we can go and save cities, that we can go and change our country, that we can go and impact the world because we have faith to believe for it. I just am convinced that God wants to do incredible things through each and every single one of us, but we gotta move. Faith is on the move. We, we can't misplace our faith. We gotta put it in the right place. It's in Jesus. He is the place of faith. Uh, Faith sets the stage, so let's set the stage, and let's do that even in the next five minutes. Let's begin setting the stage and believing God for more. And finally, let's accept the invitation that faith really is to be in relationship with Jesus and know Jesus. So let's go to worship. Love you so much. God bless you.